Hi, everybody, and welcome to NWHM Presents Sundays at Home, first but not the last virtual tour. I'm Mariana Brandman. I'm a pre-doctoral fellow in women's history here at the National Women's History Museum. And while I did not curate this exhibit, I will be uh, leading you today on our virtual tour of the exhibit, First But Not the Last, Women Who Ran for President. Uh, quickly, a little background on me. I'm a PhD candidate in history at the University of Chicago, where I work on 20th century US history, women's history, and cultural history. Um, and so today we're gonna to be going through, first but not the last, women who ran for president. Um, first, I wanna mention that this exhibit was developed and curated by Elizabeth L. Moore, who's a former director of program at NWHM, and Ashley Calloway, a former NWHN intern back in 2016. Um, so I'm gonna be going through it today, adding a little bit of updated material at the end. And um, really I'm here to provide some extra context, color, and just additional uh, background information. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to cover everybody uh, in the exhibit in this program, um, but I will be focusing generally on earlier candidates since this is a history program and as I think we're all a little more familiar with the uh, more recent candidates. I also won't be reading uh, slide by slide or, or noting every uh, photo or illustration, um, but I will try to hit on all the highlights here today. So with that, thank you for joining us and I'll get right into it. Um, first, I wanna mention some of the themes that we're gonna see as we go through this exhibit today. Uh, first, that is a theme of personal experience, that all these women who ran for president over the last century plus, um, many of them really based their advocacy work on issues with which they had firsthand experience. Um, whether that was due to their being female, their racial or ethnic background, personal circumstances, say, um, being widowed or a single parent, um, that they really just brought that experience into their work. This, I think, isn't that surprising, um, considering that they're coming from an outsider status and not um, you know, the typical elite white male uh, presidential candidates that we've had so much through our history. Um, and with that personal experience, they also brought a lot of effective grassroots campaigning um, and really connected with voters on a personal level uh, to advance their political careers. The second uh, major theme is this idea of not towing the party line. So um, these politicians often did not adhere to what the party wanted them to do or say. They often acted more independently than um, party leaders, usually male party leaders or colleagues really wanted them to. So in some cases, they even had uh, leadership or members of their own parties working against them. Um, so while we'll see candidates here from major parties, minor parties, third parties, independents, um, even the candidates we're looking at who were working within the major party system, you can't simply call them part of the machine. Um, they really were struggling against it at the same time. I also just want to note that we're going to cover a lot of firsts in this uh, tour of this exhibit. Uh, there's the first woman to run, the first woman to run on a major party ticket, first woman of color to run, first to appear on every ballot. Um, so those distinctions get pretty fine and nuanced. Um, so I just want to kind of preface that as it, it may seem a little confusing as we go through each person, um, but there just were a lot of firsts by these pioneering women. Um, and so with that, I'm going to get to the first slide here where we see a suffrage handbill entitled 12 Reasons Why Women Should Vote. Um, so a little bit of background on the suffrage movement. Um, since we're gonna be starting with our first candidate in the early 1870s, um, we need to look at the pre-suffrage years. So before the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, um, there was not universal female suffrage in the United States. Um, so what we do have is um, the very first women's suffrage in the United States actually happens uh, right around the time of the founding. It was this kind of blip on the radar. And what we have was um, enfranchised uh, property holding widows in New Jersey. 
Uh, it was kind of this aberration where they could vote early on. Um, sadly, those voting rights did not last for long, but um, that is the, the kind of fun factoid of the first one. Then really it starts with Wyoming, um, first state to grant suffrage to women in 1869. Um, this is part of a general trend of the West um, offering suffrage to women or rather women, you know, being able to claim suffrage in the West earlier than the East. It was really a westward to eastward um, movement. And that's because of the, mainly because of the demographic issues that you see at the time where um, there were lots of men, uh, mostly single men in the West at this time. And states really wanted to encourage women to come out to um, you know, offset the, the lopsided demographics. And so suffrage was used as a lure to get single women uh, to come out to the West. Then for the next 50 years, what you have is really the state by state system. Um, and that goes until 1920 when um, the 19th Amendment passes and that mandates um, suffrage on a federal level for all women in the United States. Of course, we also know that that all women in the United States is really more in theory than practice. Um, African American women were still disenfranchised, Native American women, um, poor women who were subject to poll taxes, there were still lots of um, obstacles between many women and voting. Uh, of course, the Voting Rights Act in 1965 helped with some of this, uh, but then, you know, we've seen in recent years how that has been lessened and diminished. Disenfranchisement continues today in various forms um, and is still an issue. Uh, so this uh, fight for suffrage uh, never ends. Okay, and with that, we'll start with the first woman to run for president in the United States. Um, this is Victoria Claflin Woodhull. She would run for president in 1872. Um, so Victoria Woodhull was just quite a character. She came from, quote, a wildly dysfunctional family of carnival and con man types. Um, she suffered sexual and economic exploitation in her youth, sadly, um, and we would see her later on try to fight against some of these issues. She was known to be beautiful and charming, um, very much the opposite of the dreary, uh, unattractive, unfeminine Im image that um, anti-suffragists po pushed on suffragists at the time. Um, I think we could compare this to, say, the image of Gloria Steinem during the height of the second wave of feminism in the 1970s, uh, where she very much fit into conventional beauty standards and that kind of upset the stereotype of feminists as, um, as unattractive, dreary, masculine, etc. So like I said, um, Woodhull was known for being very charismatic. She held a lot of um, very interesting jobs for a woman of her time. She worked as a spiritualist clairvoyant, as the first female stockbroker on Wall Street. Um, she and her sister were actually backed by Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, one of the most powerful men on Wall Street at the time. Uh, she, she and her sister also ran a radical weekly newspaper together called Woodhall and Claflin's Review. Um, so uh, Victoria Woodhall was actually the first woman to testify before Congress, where she made the argument that the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution actually enfranchised women as well as African-American men. This argument was known as the Suffrage New Departure Argument. Um, it was called that because it said that the 14th Amendment, um, because it says, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, end quote, um, uh, that it refers to them, that that also includes women. Now, this argument was tricky to make because Section 2 of the 14th Amendment actually talks about penalties for abridging the right to vote of male citizens. So right in the next section, you have this reference to men um, rather than women. Now, um, Victoria Woodhull and other suffragists at the time urged women to test the interpretation of this argument by registering and voting in upcoming elections. So Victoria Woodhull um, was the first woman to declare herself a presidential candidate uh, she announced her run on April 2nd, 1870, by sending in a notice that we can see here into the New York Herald newspaper. The other suffrage new departure tactic was pressuring Congress to issue a declaration 
of the, this new expansive reading of the 14th and 15th Amendments to include for female suffrage and to make it known nationwide. Now, Woodhull anticipated that by doing this, it would result in the enfranchisement of women who would then um, be a voting block for her and help her win the presidency when she ran in 1872. Um, so Woodhull represented the Equal Rights Party. Her platform included issues like an eight-hour workday, liberal divorce laws, and social welfare programs. Um, ironically, Woodhull's main disqualification for running for president was not her gender, but her age. She was only 34 at the time, and you must be 35. Um, another interesting fact about this election, the Equal Rights Party actually nominated Frederick Douglass as the vice presidential candidate but he did not um, acknowledge this nomination in any way. He did not take part in the convention. He actually endorsed the incumbent um, Republican president, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. So like other uh, women's rights activists of the era, um, Woodhull attacked the double standard that um, penalized women and not men for sexual activity. But unlike others from that time period, she wanted more sexual freedom for women, not less for men. Um, she was a proponent of free love, which meant both the lessening of state involvement in marriage and divorce, and the rejection of monogamy in favor of multiple partners. Um, it's helpful to know here at this time, the mid to late 19th century, women were gaining some rights within marriage, but it was mostly um, related to owning their own property. Whereas um, previously marriage had been set up on the coveture model, wherein a woman, when she gets married, all her property or wages automatically becomes um, property of her husband. Um, this is loosening that system. And so it is uh, I guess a step forward for women but it's also, you have to note that this was really done because it was also in the, um, to the advantage of men who for um, various reasons at different times might want their daughters or sisters, et cetera, to be able to hold family property. Um, so it's a step forward and, but cautious at the same time. Um, so that is Victoria Woodhall. Uh, yes, quite the character. I recommend learning even more about her if you can. Next, we have um, Belva Ann Lockwood. She would run for president in 1884. So Belva Lockwood part volunteered and was half drafted as the candidate for the Equal Rights Party in 1884. She stated, quote, we shall never have equal rights until we take them, nor respect until we command it. So Lockwood, um, by the age of 27, she was already a widowed mother. Um, but she still graduated from honors or graduated with honors uh, from Genesee College, which would later become part of Syracuse University. She then moved to Washington, D.C., where she married Ezekiel Lockwood um, and near the age of 40 decided that she wanted to attend law school and pursue a career in law. Uh, so it was challenging to find a law school that would admit her at the time, but she did. Uh, going to a school that would eventually become part of uh, George Washington University's law school and um, was admitted to the bar in the District of Columbia. But after she was admitted, she was still refused um, the right to practice law before the Supreme Court because of her sex. So she, her reaction to it was to spend several years energetically lobbying a bill through Congress that would change this law. Um, and in 1879, she was successful and then became the first woman to practice law before the United States Supreme Court. So as you can see from this illustration here, um, her campaign for president was mocked by many, but despite that, um, she campaigned across the country, uh, drew large crowds and was um, uh, wisely pointed out that there was nothing in the constitution that prevented her from running for president. She was a natural born citizen over the age of 35 and a resident of the United States. As she put it, I cannot vote, but I can be voted for. So Lockwood claimed to have received uh, over 4,700 votes in nine states and felt that her candidacy was a resounding success. She ran again in 1888, um, but with less acclaim and notoriety. 
And sadly, Lockwood passed away in 1917, just three years before women won the right to vote in presidential elections. Now, I'd like to pause here briefly and mention one of a few candidates um, that I will be bringing into this virtual tour who are not in the exhibit itself. Um, and there's various reasons why they may have been left out that we'll get into, um, but the first of which is Charlotta Spears Bass. Um, she would run for vice president in 1952, the first African-American woman to do so. Um, first, I encourage you to take a look at her biography on the National Women's History Museum website. Uh, I actually wrote it recently. <laughs> Um, so Bass was a longtime editor of the African-American newspaper, The California Eagle. She was a journalist, activist, politician, and fought fervently for civil rights for African-Americans. Uh, a longtime Republican, she uh, was a uh, director in Wendell Wilkie's 1940 presidential campaign, but she just grew too frustrated with the second-class treatment of African-Americans in the party, and she was also um, dissatisfied with both parties' made, um, treatment of uh, African Americans and women. Um, and so due to that frustration after that 1940 experience, she became an independent and helped to found the Independent Progressive Party of California. Um, she then ran for Congress twice, as well as Los Angeles City Council between 1944 and 1950. Those campaigns were unsuccessful. Um, but in 1951, she retired from the newspaper, sold it, moved to New York, got involved with the Progressive Party there. And, and in 1952, was named as the vice presidential candidate for the Progressive Party's ticket. California attorney Vincent Hallinan was the presidential nominee. They campaigned widely on a platform of civil rights, decent jobs, peace, and equality, but won only 0.2% of the popular vote. So presumably, Bass was excluded from the exhibit because she was a vice presidential candidate, but she's also been left out of the narrative of, of political history quite a bit. Um, she actually was just featured in the New York Times Overlook No More uh, series, where she got an obituary there. Uh, it's a great read. The Unladylike Project just did a, a phenomenal video about her life story and her influence on African American women in journalism. Um, but so I think her story also suffered neglect because there were suspicions that she harbored ties to communism. Um, she had very liberal views for the time. She praised um, the, United, the Soviet Union uh, for their treatment of racial issues um, and was under investigation by the federal government quite a bit. They um, really wanted to try to pin something on her, revoke her her postage license or passport, et cetera. Um, so due to all of that attention about um, all these suspicions of her communist uh, ties, many organizations um, that she was involved with eventually disowned her, distanced themselves from her, even other African-American organizations. Um, so I think that's one reason why her story has really uh, just not been highlighted very much until recently. Um, so now we're going to go back to the uh, exhibit, and we have Margaret Chase Smith. She would run for president in 1964. Um, Margaret Chase Smith represented the state of Maine in Congress for 34 years, from 1940 to 1974, as a Republican. Um, and let's see, she was elected to the House in a 1940 special election um, to fill the seat after the death of her husband, who had been the congressional representative for that district. Um, she won that election, which many were not surprised because of being the congressman's widow. Um, but then very soon after, she actually won the Republican primary and the general election outright, um, which did surprise many. She uh, did that in part by uh, engaging in a lot of grassroots campaigning, was arduous travel um, back and forth from DC and then all around the state of Maine. Um, so Smith, she portrayed herself as a moderate who, in contrast with liberal feminists, would work within the established order. So she used that argument for many of her campaigns, but that just because she used it doesn't mean that the established order liked her, wanted to work with her. Uh, her defining, oh, I'm sorry, she, I forgot to mention, she then in 1948 
get, was elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, that marked the first time a woman won election to the Senate outright. Um, and she was the first woman to be elected to both the House and the Senate. So then her defining moment in Congress comes when she's in the Senate in 1950. Uh, she took to the Senate floor to denounce the tactics of Wisconsin Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. Um, it was a speech she later called the Declaration of Conscience. And she said, quote, um, that her, I'm sorry, that her Republican colleague had debased Senate deliberations, quote, through the selfish political exploitation of fear, bigotry, ignorance, and intolerance. Freedom of speech is not what it used to be in America. It has been so abused by some that it is not exercised by others, end quote. Now, McCarthy did not take this sitting down. Uh, he, in retaliation, had her tossed off the a permanent investigating committee in the Senate and tried to run a candidate against her in uh, Maine in 1954. But by that point, she had a slightly different strategy um, where she felt it was best to simply ignore the challenger. She said, quote, my record is so outstanding and so effective that there isn't any use running around the state defending it. Uh, and she was right. She won that election. The investment she had put in with earlier grassroots campaigning combined with her record uh, in the House and the Senate uh, worked for her and she won that election. So Smith declared her candidacy for the Republican, Republican presidential nomination in January 1954, where she said, quote, I have few illusions and no money, but I'm staying for the finish, end quote. Um, so with her 27 delegates at the 1964 Republican Convention, she was the first woman considered for nomination for president by a major party. Um, but of course, Barry Goldwater emerged from that uh, convention as the party's candidate, and he eventually lost to the Democrat, Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, one more note about Margaret Chase Smith, that um, President George H.W. Bush awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1989, which is the nation's highest civilian honor. So now uh, I wanna look at Patsy Takemoto Mink. Uh, she would run for president in 1972. Uh, I encourage you also to take a look at her biography that we have posted on the NWHN site. Uh, so in 1964, the Hawaiian Democrat became the first woman of color and the first Asian American woman elected to Congress. Uh, she had a few signature pieces of legislation during her time in Congress, one of which was Title IX, which actually after she passed away was renamed the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act. The second one, the 1974 Women's Education Equity Act, provided funding for programs to promote gender equity in schools, uh, to increase educational and job um, opportunities for women, and to remove gender stereotypes from textbooks and school curriculas. So I like to think that the work we do here at the NWHN is really part of that legacy. A fun fact that in her first year in Congress, uh, Congresswoman Mink, along with two other women uh, members of Congress, made the news when they attempted to crash the then only, uh, <laughs> then, men's only uh, congressional gym. So that must have been uh, a rather interesting situation. In April of 1972, Mink co-sponsored a resolution calling for immediate termination of military activity in Vietnam. Uh, now this stalled in the House and nothing happened with it, but it took a lot for her to, to take this stand. It was a very bold stand. She clashed with the other members of the Hawaiian congressional delegation as well as with many constituents. Uh, Hawaii was a state with a heavy military presence, so this was not necessarily a popular stance to take, but one that um, was true to her convictions. So um, Mink's foray into presidential politics came at the request of liberal Democrats in Oregon who recruited her to run in their state's primary. Um, they thought her vocal opposition to the Vietnam War would pressure frontrunner George McGovern uh, to make the war an issue in the platform. And yes, the uh, anti-war stance did make it into the 1972 Democratic um, 
uh, party platform, but um, Mink did not actively seek the nomination at that convention. A little more on her, uh, like Margaret Chase Smith, Mink would, uh, she rankled party leaders by not towing the party line at all times. In five of her reelection campaigns, uh, she faced difficult primaries where the local Democratic Party uh, you know, ran candidates against her. Uh, twice they ran female candidates against her, um, which Mink understood solely as a move to deprive her of the gender issue. Um, Mink, you know, had a long career in Congress and, and in other political roles, um, and she always maintained a focus on issues um, affecting Asian Pacific Americans. Uh, and she did a lot of good work to educate Americans um, uh, about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Next, we're going to look at Shirley Chisholm. She would also run for president in 1972. Uh, and I also encourage you to take a look at her biography on the NWHN site. So Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman elected to Congress and a founding member of both the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Women's Caucus. She was the first African-American person to run for a major party presidential nomination. Now, uh, Chisholm got her start in early childhood education um, and was a, uh, in addition to being an educator, was a community activist. Um, she joined the League of Women Voters, the NAACP, the Urban League, as well as her local Democratic Party in Brooklyn. Um, in 1964, Chisholm ran for and became the second African-American woman in the New York State Legislature. And then in 1968, she sought a seat in Congress. Um, so when campaigning in the 1968 Democratic primary, Chisholm um, would uh, go around the district in a truck equipped with a loudspeaker um, and drive around as she told uh, anyone who could hear, ladies and gentlemen, this is fighting Shirley Chisholm coming through. So Chisholm really capitalized on her personal campaign style. She later said, quote, I have a way of talking that does something to people. Um, I also encourage you on the next slide, we have a clip of um, the press conference where Chisholm announced her run for president. I very much encourage you to watch the whole thing. I hadn't seen it before. Um, she really does have a way of speaking to people. Um, I, I was captivated by her telling a reporter she couldn't hear them, so I recommend watching it. Um, Chisholm in Congress, after she was elected, continued to work for the causes that she had fought for as a community activist. Um, causes like federal funding for daycare, guaranteed annual income for families, and education funding. She was also known at times for uh, criticizing Democratic leadership in Congress just as much as she did the Republicans in the White House. So her 1972 quest for the Democratic presidential nomination was largely symbolic, uh, undertaken to demonstrate the party's failure to adequately represent the interests of women, African Americans, and the working class. Um, so here you see the um, announcement uh, video clip that I mentioned. Um, I thought I found this clip also very interesting because she really makes a sort of Republican motherhood argument. Um, for the involvement of more women and particularly more black women in, um, in government, in legislatures. Um, she said, quote, I happen to believe that there are certain aspects of legislation that probably will be given much more attention if they had more women's voices, daycare services, mental services, social services, um, end quote, basically anything having to do with human resources. Um, so this is an argument that we see uh, Republican motherhood from the time of the founding of the United States um, onward. And it's about how it's this idea that women are uniquely suited um, to participate in government because of, of um, their role as, as domestic caretakers, as mothers, um, that they can better take care of their home by being involved in government that they could teach their sons how to be uh, you know, good and, and upright citizens. Um, but it does change over time, whereas um, early on it had a lot to do with this innate disposition of women and their kind of natural 
um, moral superiority to men, uh, then it, it tends to shift and become more about the experience that women have. Um, experience knowing what it's like in the home, what their children need. Um, and so I think by the time we get to Chisholm's announcement here, you're seeing something that's based much more in personal experience rather than an innate disposition on the part of women. But it's still a really interesting through line that you can trace. Um, I also just wanted to kind of make a plug for a show I enjoyed this summer, Mrs. America. Um, it's on Hulu and FX. Um, Shirley Chisholm is a main character in the show. She gets a standalone episode about her 1972 presidential run. She's played by Uzo Aduba. Um, it's a really compelling performance. Uh, the historian in me must always recommend that you uh, Google any dramatization of history that you see and check what's fact and fiction and what's been changed. But I do think it's, um, if you're interested in learning more about Shirley Chisholm, that uh, episode or that show is a great place to look. So back to her actual run, um, she faced many obstacles. She was blocked from participating in televised primary debates. She had to take legal action to get into them. Um, and she even faced uh, pushback from the predominantly male Congressional Black Caucus. Um, they felt she had not consulted them, uh, that she kind of betrayed their interests by forming this coalition that could um, undermine their interests. Um, according to Chisholm, gender discrimination cut across racial lines. She found that black male politicians and white male politicians were both um, very opposed to her candidacy. She said, quote, this woman thing is so deep. I found it out in this campaign if I never knew it before, end quote. So this is one quote. It's about one um, point in time in her experience. So I don't want to um, make it seem representative of her entire experience in politics, but it's compelling and evocative. So I think it's worth noting that this was her experience in 1972. Um, but also her presidential campaign strained relations with other members of the women's movement. Um, they were backing McGovern and trying to put all their leverage behind him. Um, and so it was tricky all the way around. Um, so the DNC ultimately selected George McGovern as the nominee. Um, but I also think uh, it's worth noting that in 1974, a uh, Gallup poll listed Shirley Chisholm as one of the top 10 most admired women in America. And of her legacy, Chisholm said, quote, I want to be remembered as a woman who dared to be a catalyst of change. Okay, so next we have Ellen McCormick. She would run for president in 1976. Um, she was a housewife from Long Island who decided to run for president just three years after the US Supreme Court's uh, Roe v. Wade decision on abortion, that was 1973. She ran in her words, quote, to defend the unborn child. So she ran in the Democratic primary. She was the first woman to qualify as a candidate for um, federal financing and also for secret service protection. Um, so she used that federal financing to um, so, uh, fund many of the ads like we see here, um, with her pro-life anti-choice um, position. So um, it's also important to know that 1976 was the first year that stances on abortion appeared in the Republican and Democratic Party platforms. Uh, Republicans supported a constitutional amendment to overturn Roe v. Wade, while Democrats were against such an amendment, um, but they did acknowledge ethical and religious concerns toward the issue. So after the election, she led the formation of the Right to Life Party, where she worked on that constitutional amendment to reverse Roe v. Wade. Um, she also ran for president in 1980 and appeared on the ballot in three states then. Uh, she told the media in 1976, quote, the feminists have convinced politicians they represent all women. But I am a woman too. I differ with some of their beliefs. I believe in child care for the poor, but I don't favor child care for the middle class. I think we are teaching working mothers it is more prestigious to work than to be home with their children." End quote. So here we see her um, worldview. It was also very much a part of um, the worldview of those behind the Stop ERA movement to prevent the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. And these were um, people who felt that the traditional role of wife and mother was really being demeaned by the women's rights movement and um, threatened by 
something like the ERA and uh, the, um, the decision in Roe v. Wade. Um, and so these are two important threads in the rise of conservatism in the late 20th century and onward. And you can see how they're intertwined here. For example, Phyllis Schlafly, who's best known as the leader of the Stop ERA movement, um, but she was also a major opponent of abortion rights. She praised McCormick in her uh, Eagle Forum publication for McCormick's major role in the pro-life movement. Again, I wanna pause briefly and mention uh, two vice presidential candidates who are not in this exhibit. The first is Angela Davis. She would um, run for vice president in 1980 and 1984. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of Angela Davis. She's a black activist and philosophy professor in California who at one time been on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, she actually ran on the Communist Party ticket and she and her presidential candidate, Gus Hall, uh, garnered less than 1% of the vote. Um, again, I think her candidacy um, has, has gotten less historical attention because of the stigma of communism. Um, I can tell you, I certainly know of Angela Davis. I had not known previously of her VP runs. Um, the second one, uh, the second person is LaDonna Harris. She ran for vice president in 1980. She um, was an activist and member of the Comanche Nation. She was the first Native American woman um, who, uh, to run for vice president, um, on the, and she ran on the Citizens Party ticket. Uh, in the 1970s, she'd been a force for indigenous affairs in Washington as the wife of Oklahoma Senator Fred Harris. And she ran with presidential candidate Barry Commoner on an environmental platform, also won less than 1% of the popular vote. So next we have Sonia Johnson. She would run for president in 1984. She was a traditional Mormon housewife, mother of four children. Um, she then uh, basically came to decide that she did not agree with the Mormon church's stance on the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and she said so uh, vocally, um, especially to Virginia legislators considering the issue. She was a Virginia resident at the time and she organized a group called Mormons for ERA. In 1979, Johnson, a fifth generation Mormon, uh, was excommunicated from the church for spreading false doctrine. Um, so she really experienced consequences from taking this stand. Uh, she was virtually disowned by her family after this. Um, so she hit the lecture circuit as a freelance feminist speaker in order to support her children. She demonstrated on behalf of the ERA changed herself to Mormon temples, um, took part in hunger strikes, very active. So it was a failure of the ERA um, that motivated Johnson's 1984 presidential campaign. Uh, she was nominated by two minor parties for president, the US Citizens Party and the Peace and Freedom Party. And she was the first third party candidate to qualify for primary match influence. Um, she also went on to author several books, uh, one of which um, is titled From Housewife to Heretic. Okay. Um, one more, uh, quickly adding in some other candidates. Um, the first is Sonia Johnson's own vice presidential candidate. Her name is Emma Wong Marr. Um, she was the daughter of Chinese immigrants, a longtime anti-war and pro-labor activist from California, and she was the first Asian American woman to run for vice president. Um, when she joined Johnson on the Peace and Freedom Party ticket. And then also, as many of you may know or even remember, um, Geraldine Ferraro uh, ran for vice president in 1984. The New York Congresswoman was the first uh, female vice presidential nominee on a major party ticket when Walter Mondale selected her as his running mate, um, but they did lose um, in quite the landslide against George H., uh, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Uh, so now we have Patricia Schroeder. Um, she would run for president in the 1988 election. Um, Pat Schroeder represented the Denver area in Congress for 24 years. In 1972, she was the first woman elected to Congress from Colorado, um, a state where women had been voting since 1893. The liberal Democrat ran on an anti-Vietnam War platform. Um, though political rivals and even um, Colleagues of hers who were male uh, first dismissed her as, quote, little patsy, 
um, she became a forceful congresswoman fighting to curb Cold War defense spending and um, to protect women's rights. Uh, another kind of sign of her independence or independent thinking, um, she actually earned a pilot's license uh, while she was in college and operated her own flying service uh, to pay her tuition. She graduated from the University of Minnesota in 1961, got a JD from Harvard Law School in 1964, but as just one of 15 women in a class of 500, said that she felt, quote, submerged in sexism while there. Schroeder chaired um, Senator Gary Hart's Democratic presidential campaign in 1987. Um, after that campaign fell apart, she briefly entered the race, but she did withdraw soon after when it became apparent that she just didn't have the resources to launch a serious campaign. She also um, is known for uh, a quote when she had, uh, was new in Congress, she was the mother of two small children, and a reporter asked her, how could she be a mother of two small children and a member of Congress at the same time? To which she replied, quote, I have a brain and a uterus and I use both. So now uh, we'll move to Lenora B. Fulani. Uh, she would run for president in 1988 and 1992. Um, she ran for the uh, New Alliance Party. She was the first um, African-American woman to appear on the ballot in all 50 states. And she won um, about 0.2% of the November 1988 total. So the New Alliance Party encouraged um, political independence rather than party line support for either major party. Uh, so I encourage you to watch the video that's here on this slide. Um, she strongly just encourages people to vote independently to show that the two party system is not working um, for the American people. Next to Carol Mosley Braun, um, she was the first African American woman elected to the US Senate and also only the second black senator since the Reconstruction era. Uh, she served for one term from 1992 to 1999. Um, she was motivated to run in part by um, the Supreme Court nomination hearings for Justice Clarence Thomas in 1991. Um, when uh, many American women were upset by the treatment of the woman who accused him of sexual harassment, uh, lawyer and um, law professor, Anita Hill. And so 1992 then ushered in an unprecedented wave of women into Congress. So it was called the Year of the Woman. Now we're gonna move ahead a bit. Um, I encourage you to look at um, all of these slides and learn more about them. I wish I could cover all of them. Um, there's so much good information here. Uh, I just want to briefly mention Michelle Bachman, who would run for president in 2012. Uh, in 2006, Michelle Bachman was the first Republican woman from Minnesota elected to the United States House of Representatives. By her third term, she'd become a national figure in the Republican Party. Uh, and she was a founding member of the Congressional Tea Party Caucus. So um, Michelle Bachman's five children were homeschooled and later attended private schools, and her political career stemmed from her interest in education reform. Um, she you know, got involved with the schools, took a position on um, one of the charter school's boards, and really wanted to um, get involved in showing um, in her mind how Christianity was part of American history and American civic culture. So again, you see this personal experience come to the fore. Um, in August 2011, Michelle Bachman won the Iowa Straw Poll. She was the first um, and only woman to do so, but withdrew from the, um, from the campaign a few months later uh, when her polling was low. Next, we have Jill Stein, who ran in 2012 and 2016. Um, she was a Green Party candidate. Uh, her platform included green energy, reform of the financial system, a path to citizenship for immigrants. Um, and in 1998, actually, Stein went from being a small town doctor to an environmental activist when she joined the fight to shut down the so-called uh, filthy five coal plants in Massachusetts. Again, you see that personal experience come, come to mind. Um, Jill Stein said, quote, the biggest waste of your vote is to vote for either of the corporate political parties, end quote. 
So here you see her stance in line with that of Lenora Polanyi's uh, several years earlier. Um, and now I'm going to skip ahead again and we get to Hillary Rodham Clinton, um, who would run for president in 2008 and 2016. Uh, I also encourage you to take a look at her biography on the NWHM website. Uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton is the only former first lady to hold public office, to serve as a member of a presidential cabinet, which was Secretary of State under President Obama, or run for the presidential nomination. She became the first woman to serve as a major party's nominee for president after winning the Democratic nomination in 2016. Though she won the popular vote uh, that year, she lost the election in the Electoral College. So that takes us through 2016. Um, I do just briefly want to mention about the unprecedented numbers of female candidates that um, ran in the 2020 election that's going on right now. Uh, you see um, in the Democratic primary, Tulsi Gabbard, Congresswoman from Hawaii, Marianne Williamson, a self-help author, Senators Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, Kirsten Gillibrand, and Kamala Harris. We also see uh, from the Libertarian Party, Joe Jorgensen. Um, and now, of course, um, Senator Harris is the vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party ticket. Um, I do want to end with a quote I found from Sonia Johnson that I think really applies and kind of wraps up this exhibit very well. She said, quote, I am most proud of believing in myself, taking myself seriously, and listening to my heart. Not what men tell me, not what society tells me, end quote. And that brings us to the end. Uh, I do invite you, if you have any follow-up questions, to email us at history at womenshistory.org, and we would be happy to answer or address any questions that we can. So thank you very much for joining us, and um, we hope to see you again at another NWHM event soon. Thank you.